If the what? Nearly. Just give me five minutes. Video. Ding dong diddly ds, I'm Ben Davis and welcome to episode 2 of Vlogging a Dead Horse. This week we're going to be looking at Straight Outta Nerdsville, the fourth book in the Joe Cowley series. And of course, not ignoring the fact that I already have a book out called My Embarrassing Dad's Gone Viral, which you should definitely read. But first, I thought as well as being an entertaining vlog, <laughs> we should also be an educational one. So for a new feature, we're going to be Learning German. Die Sonne. Die Sonne. Der Hut. Der Hut. Die Flippenfloppen. Die Flippenfloppen. Das Umbrücken floppen Kloppensteiger. Das umbrücken floppen Kloppensteiger. No, no, wait, 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 no, no, stop that, stop that now, that's silly, that's silly. I don't think those last two things are even German, that's just stupid. Uh, I'm going to forget that, I'm not going to be educational anymore. Uh, instead, we're going to go now to a WWE 2K16 match with commentary from your granddad. Now, what's this then? Wrestling? Oh, I don't know about that. It's not very good, is it, these days? Oh, what's this fellow's name? Finn Balor. Finn Balor? Well, that's a bit of a stupid name, isn't it? Finn Balor. What's he squatting down for, anyway? Is he in the toilet or something? Oh, and he's crawling. What a daft sod. Get up, will you? That's better. Gosh. Oh, dear. So he's walking down to the uh, to the ring, then. Uh, to, to fight, presumably. I mean, he doesn't look like a very tough man. I mean, he looks a bit daft, to be honest with you. Uh, but, uh, oh, I'm only squatting down. I'll oh, just stop it. Carry on, will you? You're wasting me to... Oh, oh you, you frightened me to death, you silly. Oh, no, you silly sod. Right. Oh, what a stu... I mean, look at him. I mean, he's wearing sleeves with with no, nothing on his torso. It's, he's just wearing sleeves on his arms. I mean, what can... I don't know much about fashion, but that just seems daft. To, to be walking around with just sleeves on and nothing on your chest. I mean, he'll catch his death. And now, now watch it. Oh, he's, he's bloody squatting down again. Silly butt. Ah, here we go. Right, okay, I think we're ready. I mean, he's still wearing sleeves, but... Uh, oh, here we go. Here's the other fella. Well, I seem to like him, don't they? Hopefully he's uh, dressed a bit more sensibly. And he's wearing sleeves on his arms, like some sort of idiot. Oh, wow, well, I spoke too soon. I mean, look at him. That blue. Hustle, loyalty, respect. Well, I like loyalty and respect, but I don't know about hustle. Oh, no, what's... Has, he... has he brought a tea towel out with him? Why has he brought a tea towel? Is he, uh... is he going to do some drying up while he's out here? Oh, this is just silliness. Right, OK. So, oh, he's running towards him and he's always... Oh, I mean, what was that? This is, uh... I mean, I used to like the wrestling when I was a lad. I used to go to uh, Blackpool Pleasure Beach. Uh, to watch the wrestling, and it was it were a lovely day. It were uh, sixpence to get in, which was a lot of money in them days, but you got your money's worth because it included a uh, pint of mild and half a chicken. And you saw eight fights, and it were very good. It were very good. They were proper tough men wrestling in those days. Not this silliness, bloody thin below with his stupid sleeves. It were real men. And, uh, I mean, never trust a man who shaves under his arms. That's my motto. I mean, I mean, just look at Hitler. He shaved under his arms, didn't he? I mean, look at how he was always lifting his arm up like that. I mean, that wasn't a salute. That were a shaver's rash. <laughs> oh, you've got to laugh, ain't you? But, uh, yeah, as I've said, I used to go to Blackpool to watch a fight, and it were great. I mean, and then none of them shaved under their armpits. Not at all. The hairier, the better. In fact, the champion, his name were uh, Bobby Stewart, and he had the hairiest armpits you've seen in your life. He, uh, it looked like he had two small hedgehogs under his arm. It was quite incredible. And uh, his finishing move was he would force his opponent's face into his hedgehog-like armpit. 
and uh, that would always render them unconscious and he would win. It, uh, oh, oh, look at that, that's just dangerous. There was none of that back at Blackpool. They would never climb up, I mean, they were all about 30 stone, so they'd have brought the ring light, but, uh, but even so, that's just silliness. Uh, but back then, you know, the ordinary folk could get involved, not this computer game nonsense. I mean, the wrestler, or Bobby Stewart, he'd get up in the ring and he'd say, who wants to come and challenge me? And uh, and I did a few times, and it was fine. I mean, yes, I did get my neck broken at least half a dozen times. But, uh, you know, people were tougher in those days. I were back on the Big Dipper that very same afternoon with my broken neck, and you know, it was fine. I uh, went back to pub and everything, and I didn't make a fuss about it. Hey, up, he's up on the top again. He's always oh, bloody stamped on him. Oh, he stamped right on him, the dirty sod. Here we go. One, two... Uh, oh, his, his, his bloody dad didn't keep him down. Oh, well, I've never seen anything like that. Bloody sleeve-wearing hooligan, Finn Balor. Oh, dear. Oh, now he's shoved his head between his legs. What's he doing now? Oh, oh well, this is barbaric. And that music they were playing when they come out. I mean, I'm mostly deaf, but I found it very unsettling. I, uh, As you know, I lost my hearing in Germany. Uh, yeah. I wasn't in the war, I just stood too close to an umpire band. And I remember I said to your grandmother that night, I said, Miriam, I'm not going to let this spoil the holiday. And you know what she said to me? Oh, well, neither do I, because I was deaf. Uh, but uh, I'm sure it was something uh, very nice, because she were a lovely woman, your grandmother. And uh, she would... Uh, I don't know what she'd think if she knew I were watching this silliness. Uh, but uh, But there we have it. Uh, what's going... Oh, oh, he's kicked him right at the back of the head. Oh, you dirty sod, Finn Balor. He's, uh, oh, now he's... Uh, I mean, he's knocking hell out of him, isn't he? Oh, he ain't half giving him a good hiding. Oh, dear. Oh, and he's too tired, look, he's tired. Bloody Bobby Stewart, he used to fight five times a day at the Pleasure Beach. And he wasn't tired. He'd, he'd fight in the morning... And then he'd be straight in the horseshoe bar upstairs for a pie and a pint. And then he would fight again in the afternoon. And then again back to the horseshoe bar for another pie. And uh, a couple of pints usually. And then in the evening again he would, uh, he would fight again. And then he would have several pies and several pints. And he, was, uh, and he lived to, for the ripe old age of uh, 39. Uh, which is quite old. Ooh! Oh dear, oh we bloody dropped him on his head. Here we go, one, two, three, oh he's won, the dirty sods won. Finn Balor, with his stupid sleeves, has won that match. I would like to see Finn Balor up against Bobby Stewart at Blackpool Pleasure Beach because I think that, I think Bobby Stewart could teach him a thing or two about putting on a proper fight, I do. I think he would easily beat this Finn Balor fella. Anyway, uh, oh, it looks like it's over. Right, put kettle on, will you? I'm bloody gasping. Oh, bless him. You know, you really should visit him more often. Anyway, now we're going to move on to Straight Outta Nerdsville, the fourth book in the Joe Cowley series. Uh, it uh, picks up after the events of uh, Joe Cowley 3. And Joe is now living in London with his friends Harry Adam Greeny. They're about to embark on a... A magical journey in the record industry, the sound experience, uh, the band that uh, Harry and Ad formed and have Greeny along with them have uh, been signed to a record label. Joe's going to be their manager, he's going to work with a record label. It's all very exciting stuff and Joe wants to show that he's a sophisticated young man and that he can be trusted with such a responsibility and more importantly that he can impress his new girlfriend Mila who is a very sophisticated London type person and uh, he wants to show that he can hang with her and do all the cool things. And of course, being Joe, he struggles with that a little bit. Now, as you may be aware, uh, Straight Outta Nerdsville is a reference to a rap song by NWA called Straight Outta Compton, which was later made into a film. And I thought, keeping with the musical trend, I could uh, make my own little music video uh, to go along with it, seamlessly blending the old with the new. Let me know what you think. Nerdsville. Okay. Joe. The sound experience. So now it's time to give you a sneak preview of Straight Outta Nerdsville. And just to set the scene of this a little bit, 
uh, Joe and the lads have decided that they are going to attempt to get into a party that's happening upstairs in the penthouse. They're not invited to it, but they thought they could bring a bottle of something nice uh, that they would let them in. Now, they didn't really have a bottle of anything nice, but they did find something in their cupboard that belongs to their uh, very strict Ukrainian chaperone, Mrs. Gleber. And uh, that's how they're going to try to get in. So, uh, here we go. Right, I said to the lads on the landing outside the penthouse, I've consulted Men's Domain and found some tips for us. Harry chuckled, you and that bloody website. Why can't you go in and be yourself? You mental, said Greeny. You see what happens when he does that, yeah? Good point, old Dean, said Harry. I suppose you should hear these tips then. One, prepare some amusing anecdotes. Ah, we've got loads of those, old Dean, said Harry. What say we regale them with a story about the time we threw piss balloons at Gav James? Two, bring a gift. Done, said Ad, holding up a bottle that we found at the back of the cupboard. We had no idea what it was because the label was in Ukrainian, but it definitely counted as a gift. The whole meal of bringing one plan didn't work out because you've got to go out with the family, it won't be over till later. Three, dress sharp. I've taken care of that one ensured we were all coordinated with matching black suits and ties. I reckon we look proper professional. Greeny agreed and ruined it by saying undertakers are professionals, right? I knocked the door and the woman I saw in the lobby answered. She frowned and said, can I help you? Uh, we're from number 53, I said, and we just thought we'd bring you this bottle as a token of our esteem. She looked at the bottle with a raised eyebrow. Kolochnachtikov. Mm, sounds exotic. It is, said Harry. It's from Ukraine. Our friend from there recommended it. How international of you, she said with a little smile. That ain't the half of it, said Ad. Joe's girlfriend's Hollandish. Note to self, next time we go to a sophisticated party, gag Ad. Well, as you brought us a bottle, I suppose we should invite you in, she said. Success! She led us inside while Harry mouthed something at me about how she was the one who totally fancied him. The penthouse was amazing. Our flat's pretty swanky. This place made it look like Mad Morris's bus shelter. Everyone there looked dead smart. They were all older than us, but not ridiculously old, like my mum or something. I could already tell this was going to be the kind of grown-up London party we should have been attending all along. My name's Tabitha, she said. Would you guys like some canapes? No, Tar, said Ad. I promised my mum I'd stay away from drugs. Luckily, Tabitha laughed and said, Right, let's see that Ukrainian stuff. I handed it over. Another woman appeared from the kitchen holding a tray of yet more canapes. There were no cheese and pineapples on sticks, which my old non-sophisticated Tamerson self would have been outraged about. This is my flatmate, Maddie, said Tabitha. Maddie, these are the boys from 53. I waved. I mean, what the hell? Who waves at a party? I turned the wave into a nose scratch sharpish and said hi instead. You lads are over 18, aren't you? Maddie asked. We looked at each other. No one was saying anything. I guessed it was going to be up to me. Yeah, of course we are, I said. How do you think we bought this... drink? God, I hoped it wasn't drain on blocker. Wicked, said Maddie, who was quite possibly the poshest person I'd ever met. And you'll join us in a wee snifter? Ad spluttered with laughter. Pfft, wee snifter. I subtly trod on his foot before turning back to Maddie. Sounds great. Oh, none for me, thanks, said Greeny. I'm uh, straight edge. Harry nodded. Uh, yes, yes, me too. That goes for me and all, said Ad. I'm straight ledge. Looks like it's just three of us then, said Tabitha, filling three tiny glasses with a clear liquid. Bottoms up. I ignored Ad giggling again, picked up one of the glasses and sniffed it. Oh my god, I think it may have singed my nose hairs. On the count of three, said Maddie. One, two. Maddie and Tabitha lifted their glasses and knocked their drinks back, one in one go. At the same time, I lifted mine but wussed out at the last second and threw it over my shoulder into a potted plant. When I looked up, Maddie and Tabitha were wiping tears from their eyes. Wow, that stuff has a kick, said Tabitha. I think my insides are burning, said Maddie, looking at me. Hey, what's your name? Um, Joe, I said, hoping that noticed their plant withering. Joe is hardcore, she said. Looks like he hasn't been affected by it. Incredible, said Harry. It's almost as if he didn't drink it at all. After that, the party went like a dream. I accidentally, not, let slip that the guys were in a band that's attached to PGS Records, and Tabitha and Maddie got super excited and took us around the room introducing us to their friends. And what friends? Never before have I encountered such luminaries. There are artists, writers, gallery owners, and my family parties, the closest thing we are to an artist is my cousin Dibble, who sharpies willies on toilet cubicles. Plus, I finally discovered the secret of surviving social events. Don't talk. All I did was listen and occasionally chip in with the fascinating or intriguing. It was even better when Mila arrived, because she's pretty posh, so she fit right in. I looked around and the other guys seemed to be enjoying it too. Even Ad, I overheard one bloke say he wanted to write a free-form jazz odyssey about him. He called it Space Cadet. It was all going so well that we lost track of time. Mila and I had been chatting to another couple for over an hour. 
who were both artisanal bakers who made political egg custards and were about to arrange to meet up and sample some. It felt good to find them grown-up conversations with real London people. I mean, our flat is great and everything, but the talk isn't exactly intellectual. The other day, we nearly got into a fight over whether you should sit down or stand up to wipe your bum. It's sit down, and anyone who tells you otherwise is a monster. Anyway, Claude was looking for a business card to give us when the door flew open. Everyone turned and stared. In such a civilised environment, the bang was shocking. What time are you calling this? Mrs Gleiber yelled. Oh, crap. I glanced at my watch. It was midnight. Do you think I am giving you boys curfew for good of my health? She boomed. Go to your rooms, now! Tabitha carefully approached Mrs Gleiber. Can I help you, madam? Don't madam me, hussy mama. You invite children to party? Claude and Marie stared at me as if I were a leper. I mean, how did they know it was me Mrs Gleiber was talking about? It could just as easily have been Gabriel, the bongo poet. I'm sorry, said Tabitha, but they told us they were 18. Mrs Gleiber glared at all four of us. Then they dirty, stinking liars. If I was their mother, I am putting them over my knee. Oh God, this was the worst thing ever. I could feel all my grown-up sophisticated credibility running away from me like so much camembert fondue. Wait, what is this? Mrs. Gleiber stomped into the flat and picked up the bottle of clack 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 clack. Not only are they dirty rule breakers and dirty liars, but they're also dirty thief. That's it. She reached across the table, grabbed Harry and Ad by their ears and dragged them out of the flat. Then she came back and did the same to Greeny. I looked for an escape but found none. No matter where I hid, I knew Mrs. Gleiber would find me. She had a nose like a bloodhound. And also she had a really good sense of smell. Before I knew it, I felt the cold fingers of doom clamped around my ear and I was being ferociously dragged out of the party. Besides the squeak of my freshly polished shoes on the wooden floor, the whole room was silent. Um, Claude, Marie, I said, we'll, we'll meet up sometime in the week, yeah? They wouldn't make eye contact. No good for you, I said. Uh, how about next weekend? Sunday's best for me. Nothing. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll see you soon, Mila, I said. Mila winced. Yeah, bye, Joe. Oh, I can't believe it. I had it right there in my hand. I was finally going to be an urbane London night with friends with names like Jocasta and Peregrine. Mila was finally going to think I was cool enough for her, and not some hillbilly from the sticks. I was going to be a new Joe. A rebirth. Then it was all snatched from me by a demon in an apron. And that's it for this week's vlog in a dead horse. Buenos noches!